Hello, third grade, and welcome to unit six, week three. We're going to begin with our vocabulary words, and our first word is the word professional. So a professional is someone who does a job, and they're trained to do, do a job, but they do it for money. They get paid to do it. They are not just volunteering or doing it for fun. Our second word is the word research. When you do research, you're carefully studying or learning about something. So just like when you guys did your uh, biography research project, you were carefully looking at different people and the important events in their life. Our next word is the word essential. Essential is a synonym for the word important or necessary. They all have the same meaning. So something that is essential is something that is very important. Next, we have the word serious. Something that is serious is also important, right? It's something that's, it's not something that's silly or something that you do really easily. It's something you really have to think about and think very carefully about uh, before you decide on it. Next, we have the word specialist. A specialist is someone who is an expert at doing a particular thing. So you can have a specialist who's a doctor. So they're a doctor, but they studied extra in a particular kind of thing. So maybe they're a pediatrician, right? So they're a specialist for little kids, or maybe they're an optometrist. They're a specialist for eyes, studying eyes. Next, we have the word communicate. When you communicate, it means you're sharing information with other people. Our next word is the word goal. A goal is a purpose or an aim. It's a thing that you want to get to. So your goal might be to get um, an A plus at the end of the year in your math class. So that's something that you're working towards. You're studying, you're doing all of the work, you're spending extra time. So that's what a goal is. Next, we have the word motivate. To motivate um, is to make someone want to do a thing or to take an action. So when you motivate someone, you're encouraging them, right? You're telling them you can do it. I believe in you. Uh, you're telling them all the reasons that they should do it and why it's good for them. So you're giving them reasons and you're pushing them to take that action or do that thing. Now, for your spelling words this week, we're going to be working on vowel teams. Now, vowel teams can be found in syllables. So specifically, vowel team syllables are when you find a vowel um, plus a consonant, or it's two vowels. So either you have two vowels like A, I, E, A, O, A, or you have a vowel and a consonant, O, W, O, Y, things that make a long vowel sound. So vowel teams, whether it's a va two vowels next to each other or a vowel plus a certain kind of consonant, all make a long vowel sound. Now, some of the most common ones, again, are A-I, E-A, O-A, I-E, E-E, O-U, O-W, O-Y, E-Y, and A-Y. So you're not going to see all of them in your words here, but those are some of the most common ones that we find. So you have the word explained, remain, Reading, detail, free soak, monkey, brief, preteen, bout, allowing, complain, enjoys, poison, repeat, unreal, able, hostile, foul, repaid, and approach. So you're seeing the AI in explained and remain. You're seeing the EA in reading the AI in detail, the OA in pre-soak, the EY in monkey, IE in brief, the EE in preteen, the OU in about, the OW, which is a vowel and a consonant in allowing, and so on. So if you look through your words, you're going to find those combinations. Now we're going to start with our notes and we're going to start by talking about different Greek and Latin roots and their meaning. So many of the root words, or many of the words in the English language have roots in the Greek and Latin languages. So some examples of Greek and Latin roots are going to be listed right here for you. So the first one is mir, M-I-R. 
and it means wonder or amazement. So if something is a miracle or you admire something or you see a mirage, those are things that are wonderful or amazing in different ways. Orb means circle, so an orbit. So when something is moving in a circular pattern or something is orbital. Next we have the root or, O-R, which means mouth. So oral, like your oral health means taking care of your mouth and your teeth. An orator is a speaker, right? A speaker uses their mouth. Next, we have the root fin, F-I-N, which means end. So final, finish, finale, all of those are related to the meaning end or the end of something. So SID, C-I-D means to fall, kill, or cut. So an accident is if you accident, you know, you fall unintentionally. A pesticide um, is a, a chemical that they put to kill weeds in a garden. And if you decide something, that means you're cutting out the other options. So if you had to choose between two different things and you had to decide which one you wanted, you cut off the one that you didn't want and you stayed with the one that you did want. Next, we have the root graph, which means to write. So graph, you can find it in autograph, in pictograph, digraph, biography. All of those words have the root word graph in them. Next, we have the root astro, which means star or something from outer, outer space, like an astronaut is someone who goes out into space. Astronomy is the study of the outer space and the planets and the stars. Our next root is photo, which means light. So a photograph is basically something that's written or drawn with light. Something that is photoelectric is getting electricity through light energy. And next we have the root tele, T-E-L-E, -E, which means something that's far or far off or something that, that goes over a long distance. So a telephone, when you're making a telephone call, you're making a call or you're communicating with someone over a far distance. A telegraph is a letter, right? So if you wrote out a letter to your friend and it's delivered over a far distance, a telescope shows us things that are far away in the sky. Next, we're going to talk about adverbs. So an adverb tells us more about an action verb. And it's almost always going to answer the question, how, when, or how often, and where. The words like slowly, loudly, carefully, quickly, quietly, or sadly, those are all adverbs. An adverb usually, but not always, will end in an L-Y when it's telling us how something is done. So if they read the book quickly, or we walked quietly through the house, or she was practicing her cursive writing carefully after school, telling us how she's doing it or how they're doing it. Now, adverbs that tell us how, or sorry, when or how often uh, are like the bolded words that we see over here. We arrived late to class today, so late is when we arrived. Please remember to buy your zoo tickets early before they sell out. I'm getting ready for bed now. We always buy groceries from the farmer's market. I have a yearly membership to Disneyland or I never want to see a tarantula in real life. So these are all telling us when something is happening or how often. So late tells us when, early tells us when, now also tells us when, always, yearly or never tells us how often something is happening. And then we have adverbs that tell where. So where um, is basically telling you some kind of direction. So the car turned right at the stop sign. So right is telling us a direction where it's turning. I stepped forward to do my presentation. The little bird flew away. We hiked up the mountain. Please put your backpack there on the rack. These are all words that are telling us where. That's the end of our notes for this week. We're going to go ahead and jump into our literature anthology book where we're going to be reading a biography about an astronaut. Genre, biography, out of this world, the Ellen Ochoa story by Leanne B. Onish. Essential question, why are goals important? 
Read about Ellen Ochoa. Find out how she reached her goals. How many people can say that their jobs are out of this world? Ellen Ochoa, a, uh, cho, a, uh, can. She is the first female Hispanic American astronaut. Her job has taken her out of this world four times. Don't be afraid to reach for the stars. I believe a good education can take you anywhere on Earth and beyond. Ellen Ochoa. Reaching for the Stars. Ellen Ochoa was born in California in 1958, the same year the space program began. Back then, only men became astronauts. This was a problem for women who wanted to go into space. Women were not allowed to even apply for the job. Luckily, the space program began accepting women in 1978. Sally Ride, the first female astronaut, went into space in 1983. In fact, it was Sally Ride's mission that gave Ellen Ochoa the idea of becoming an astronaut. When Ellen Ochoa began college, she thought she would be a professional musician, then changed her mind. When she went to Stanford University, she heard about the skills an astronaut required. She decided to try to join the astronaut program. Unfortunately, Ochoa was not chosen. She did not have the right skills. Most astronauts were men. She wasn't a military pilot like many astronauts. She wasn't athletic and strong. But Ellen wanted to go into space. She knew this was a problem she could solve. I can't imagine not wanting to go into space, Ochoa says. She did not give up her dream. Ellen Ochoa trained hard to become an astronaut. Young Ellen was a good math and science student. Stop and check. Reread. What inspired Ellen Ochoa to become an astronaut? Reread to find out. At Stanford, Ochoa studied subjects related to space. She did research for several inventions that helped solve problems in space. One of her inventions helped guide robotic arms for work in space. Robotic arms look like human arms. They have parts that move like a shoulder, an elbow, and a wrist. They do jobs that are too hard or dangerous for people. Many tasks in outer space require astronauts to use robotic arms. Ochoa's experience with robotic arms helped her get into the astronaut program in 1991. Ochoa controlled the space shuttle's robotic arm. One of Ochoa's inventions helps guide robotic arms. Training in space. Before she could join the space program and be an astronaut, Ochoa had one more problem to solve. She had to get herself ready. It was not an easy task. She began training in 1990. Her strong background in math and science helped her do well in these new classes. She also had to pass a physical exam to get into the program. She learned to work on the real machines astronauts use during space flights. In training, things keep breaking and problems have to be solved, Ochoa says. I was in training for three years before my first mission. During training, astronauts work on machines that get them used to working in space. One machine creates weightlessness conditions that astronauts feel in space. Weightlessness is the fun part of the mission, Ochoa says. I guess the closest thing would be swimming or scuba diving. What is odd is that weightlessness seems more natural. Astronauts are trained to get used to feeling weightless. Stop and check. Reread. How did Ellen Ochoa train to be an astronaut? Reread to find out. An interview with Ellen Ochoa. Student reporters interviewed Ellen Ochoa. Here are some of their questions and her answers. What is NASA training like? In training, we prepare for anything that could happen on a space mission, anything that could go wrong. Nothing has ever gone wrong on any of my missions, and our training helps us make sure that nothing will. For my last mission, we trained for nine months before the actual flight. How do you sleep on the space shuttle? On my last mission, we slept in what can best be described as a sleeping bag with hooks, 
you would find a place to hook onto and float in. What do you look for in a potential astronaut and what is their average age? Most of the people who are selected are between the ages of 30 to 40. We look for a college education in science or technology. We look for people who can do many things well because people with multiple skills can usually learn things quickly. This is a very important skill for an astronaut. Astronauts are able to sleep even in weightless conditions. Space work is teamwork. An astronaut must be both a team player and a leader as well, Ochoa says. She tells students, you should get involved in activities where you work closely with other people. Working closely with others is an essential part of being an astronaut and solving problems in space. First, there is the ground crew. They inspect and repair the shuttle before each mission. Next, mission control workers guide the astronauts through each moment of a mission and debrief them on procedures. They are responsible for knowing how equipment is working and how the astronauts are feeling. The crew on a space shuttle must work together to get their jobs done. During a space flight, the teamwork continues. Ochoa and the other astronauts work together to meet the goals of their mission. A space flight crew is like a sports team. The commander of the shuttle is the team captain. He or she makes the crucial decisions that have serious effects on a mission. On her first mission in 1993, Ellen Ochoa was a mission specialist. Mission specialists are scientists who do experiments. Ochoa used a robotic arm to send and get back a satellite that collected information about the sun. Then, in 1994, Ochoa was the payload commander on her second mission. The payload might be supplies or equipment such as the robotic arm. She did satellite studies of the sun's effects on Earth's climate or weather. Each person in mission control works together to make the mission a success. Space Jobs In 1999, Ochoa was a mission specialist again on a space flight. During this flight, she and the crew delivered supplies to the International Space Station. She also walked in space for the first time during this mission. Finally, in 2002, Ochoa took her last space flight. Again, she worked on the International Space Station. She used the robotic arm to deliver supplies and help build new parts of the space station. Between missions, Ochoa continued working. She worked with astronauts and ground crew to prepare for other space missions. Astronauts have to work closely together in tight spaces. Ellen Ochoa's life today. Today, Ochoa likes to travel to tell students and teachers about her experiences as an astronaut. She finds it exciting to communicate with students. She tells them how she solved the problem of becoming an astronaut. She likes to describe life aboard the space shuttle. I'm not trying to make every kid an astronaut, but I want kids to think about a career and the preparation they'll need, Ochoa says. I tell students that the opportunities I had were a result of having a good educational background. Education is what allows you to stand out. Ellen Ochoa has realized her dream. She became an astronaut, and she has traveled into space four times. Altogether, Ochoa has spent nearly 980 hours in space. Her space missions have taken her more than 16 million miles around Earth. That is more than 640 trips around Earth at the equator. Ellen Ochoa's job has truly taken her out of this world. Blast off! Some facts about Ellen's trips. STS-56 Atlas II Discovery Date, April 4 through 17, 1993 Time and space, 9 days Miles traveled, 3.9 million STS-66, Atlantis Date, November 3 through 14, 1994 Time and space, 11 days Miles traveled, 4.5 million. STS-96, Discovery. 
Date, May 27 to June 6, 1999. Time and space, 10 days. Miles traveled, 3.8 million. STS-110, Atlantis. Date, April 8 to 19, 2002. Time and space, 10 days. Miles traveled, 4.5 million. Stop and check. Summarize. What do astronauts do? Tell the details you learned in this story. Genre. Adventure story. Compare texts. Read about a girl who has a big goal. A flight to Lunar City. Get ready for landing, announced Commander Buckley. Fantastic, whispered Maria, clinging tightly to her robot pooch. She could see the gray, dusty surface of the moon out the lunar lander's window. Going to the moon had been Maria's goal since she was five. The dream had motivated Maria to enter a science project in the National Space Contest. She had invented Robbie, the robot dog, as her science project. He was the perfect moon pet. Maria and Robbie had won first prize, a trip to Lunar City, the first settlement on the moon. Now they were almost there. Robbie wriggled and squirmed. Settle down, Maria scolded. Sometimes Robbie was awfully wild, like a real puppy. Maria was thinking about adjusting his personality profile program to make him a little calmer. Suddenly, there was a large bang. The lunar lander jerked forward and turned upside down. Then it rolled sideways. The lights on the ship dimmed. The emergency lights came on. The power is off, gasped Commander Buckley. We're stuck. Oh no, cried Maria. Woof, yapped Robbie as he squirmed and wiggled in Maria's arms. Hold on, said Commander Buckley. She pushed buttons and touched the control screen. She tried to contact the landing station. Nothing worked. This control stick is broken, said Commander Buckley in a panic. We can't move ahead. She tried to push the control stick into the right position for landing, but it would not budge. Just then, Robbie jumped out of Maria's arms and leaped across the landing ship. He jumped onto the stick with all four paws and growled fiercely. He tugged and chewed on it. Stop, cried Maria. All at once, the control stick shifted into position. The lights came back on. The landing ship whooshed forward. Robbie, you did it, laughed Commander Buckley. Good dog. She handed Robbie back to Maria. Now we can land on the moon. Maria smiled proudly. Robbie was the best robot dog ever. Make Connections what was Maria's goal? What did she do to reach it? What other people with goals have you read about? How are they like Maria? How are they different? All right, that takes us to the end of our reading and our literature anthology. Let's go ahead and jump into our reading and writing workshop. Where we're going to be reading another biography about space. Genre, biography, rocketing into space. Essential question. Why are goals important? Read how one man used his education and experience to reach his goals. When James A. Lovell Jr. was a boy, he loved to build rockets and launch them into the sky. But his dreams went a lot farther than his rockets. Like many boys who grew up in the 1930s, Lovell dreamed of being a pilot. And as he watched his rockets soar, he knew someday he would, too. High-Flying Dreams Lovell was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1928. He worked hard in school and planned to go to a special college to study astronomy and rockets. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough money to attend. 
Lovell had to figure out another way to reach his goal. Lovell was motivated to find a way to fly rockets, so he went to college near his home for two years and then signed up for flight training at the United States Naval Academy. After four years at the academy, Lovell joined the United States Navy and became a professional naval test pilot. His job was to fly planes before anyone else was allowed to fly them. James A. Lovell Jr. became an astronaut in 1962. He flew four space missions. Pilot to Astronaut As a pilot, Lovell spent more than half of his flying time in jets. He taught other pilots how to fly. He also worked as a specialist in air flight safety. Soon, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, put out a call for astronauts. Lovell applied for the job because he had all the essential skills needed to fly into space. As a result, NASA chose him. By 1962, James Lovell was an astronaut. He had finally reached his goal. Big Challenges Lovell flew on three space missions, and then, in April 1970, he became commander of the Apollo 13 mission. This was a big responsibility and a great honor. This was also one of the biggest challenges of Lovell's life. Apollo 13 was supposed to land on the moon. Two days after leaving Earth, however, the spacecraft had a serious problem. One of its oxygen tanks exploded. The crew did not have enough power or air to breathe. They could not make it to the moon. Lovell communicated with the experts at NASA. No one knew what to do at first. Then the team on the ground did some research and came up with a solution. The astronauts followed the team's directions and built an invention using plastic bags, cardboard, and tape. It worked. It cleaned the air in the spacecraft. But the next problem was even bigger. How were the astronauts going to get back to Earth? NASA's team works to solve Apollo 13's problem. A job well done. The NASA team decided the astronauts would use the lunar or moon module as a lifeboat. James and the other two astronauts climbed into the smaller spacecraft and shut the hatch tight. They moved away from the main spaceship. With little power, water, food, or heat, the astronauts listened carefully to the team at NASA. The trip back to Earth was dangerous and scary. For almost four days, the astronauts traveled in a cramped capsule. They were cold, thirsty, and hungry. Then, with millions of people watching on television, the module fell to Earth. Years later, James Lovell said that Apollo 13 taught him how important it was for people to work together. His favorite memory was when the capsule splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and the diver knocked on the window to let them know they were safe. A dream come true. Did you ever dream of going into space? Check out Space Camp. Space camps have been around for more than 30 years. They make science, math, and technology exciting so kids will want to learn more. And like the NASA training programs, these camps teach the importance of teamwork and leadership. The Apollo 13 crew splashed down safely on April 17, 1970. Make Connections How did James A. Lovell's goals as a child help him as an adult? Tell about one of your goals and how you might achieve it. Reread. Stop and think about the text as you read. Are there new facts and ideas? Do they make sense? Reread to make sure you understand. Find text evidence. Do you understand what James A. Lovell Jr. did to become a pilot? Reread High Flying Dreams on page 435. He worked hard in school and planned to go to a special college to study astronomy and rockets. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough money to attend. 
Lovell had to figure out another way to reach his goal. Lovell was motivated to find a way to fly rockets, so he went to college near his home for two years and then signed up for flight training at the United States Naval Academy. After four years at the academy, Lovell joined the United States Navy and became a professional naval test pilot. I read that James Lovell went to college and then to the United States Naval Academy. He signed up for flight training and became a professional naval test pilot. James Lovell became a pilot by going to school. He never gave up. Problem and Solution Some informational texts describe a problem, tell the steps taken to solve the problem, and give the solution. Signal words such as problem, solution, solve, and as a result show there is a problem and the steps to a solution. Find text evidence. James Lovell wanted to fly rockets but didn't have enough money to go to a special college. That was his problem. What steps did he take to solve his problem? What was the solution? Graphic organizer. Problem. James wanted to fly rockets, but he didn't have enough money to go to a special college. James went to college near his home. He became a test pilot. He joined NASA and became an astronaut. Solution. As an astronaut, James Lovell was able to fly in rocket ships. Biography. Rocketing into space is a biography. A biography tells the true story of a real person's life, is written by another person, includes text features such as keywords, photographs, and captions. Find text evidence. I can tell that rocketing into space is a biography. It is the true story of James Lovell's life. It has photographs with captions and key words that are important to the biography. Text features. Key words. Key words are important words. They are in dark type. Photographs. Photographs and their captions show more about the events in the person's life. Greek and Latin roots. Many words have word parts, such as Greek or Latin roots, in them. The Greek root astro means star, and not means ship. The Latin root luna means moon. Find text evidence. On page 435, I see the word astronomy. I remember that astro comes from a Greek root that means star. I think astronomy must have something to do with the stars. It may mean the study of the stars. He worked hard in school and planned to go to a special college to study astronomy and rockets. All right, that takes us to the end of our notes and our readings for this week. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.